All right. Welcome back, juniors. Um, so great news. The only assignment you have today is to listen to my very beautiful voice as I talk to you about World War II and take notes. That's it. Reason being, um, I'm going to be grading or not grading, giving feedback on your DBQs, which you've all turned in in theory, right? Right. Um, and I need to give myself some more time since I'm reading about 120 DBQs in theory if people are turning things in. And I just don't really feel like I have anything for you to work on yet until I read the DBQs, but you do need to know about World War II because I have a feeling it's going to be on this AP exam. Um, okay, so we're going to do two lessons with World War II. The first is today, and it's just talking about the war and like the governments and stuff like that. And then the next one's talking about it within the United States. Um, because this war highlights some pretty significant disparities and racism in the U.S. Okay, so World War II, the war to end all wars, the last world war we had, um, starts from 1939 to 1945. So let's just jump right in. Okay, so since this is U.S. history, I'm going to have a more United States lens to it. I think most of you learned about World War II last year, or in some sort of capacity in life. Sorry about the barking dogs. Okay. Um, so during the 1930s, remember we have the Great Depression going on, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, the U.S. was more isolated than anything else. So as they start seeing some weird, funky stuff happening in Europe, some weird, funky stuff happening in the Pacific Islands, Japan, and Asia, the U.S. is like, no, we're going to step out of this and kind of took this role of we're not going to get involved, especially when they're starting to see the rise of Hitler and Nazis. Um, like, oh, that's not our war to fight. Pretty easy to do when you're not actually in Europe. You know what I mean? And you have like two oceans separating you from where wars are actually happening. But n neither here nor there. So in 1935, um, Congress passes the Neutrality Act. Neutrality Acts. Say that 10 times. Go ahead. Just kidding. The Neutrality Acts, which basically said that the U.S. will not choose a side for Europe, won't get involved, won't do anything. Also in the U.S., um, you have a lot of Hitler sympathizers. There's actually a show on HBO right now. It's called The Plot Against America, who talks about Charles Lindbergh, who was trying to run for president. Uh, and it kind of insinuates that he was a Nazi himself. Um, and so you have some like people in the U.S. Fascism is a big thing around the world. And of course, in the U.S., when you have, quote unquote, freedom of speech, you're allowed to say some crazy stuff like that and believe in those types of things. Anywho, point being, Great Depression's going on. We got some other issues. People are probably fascist. Some of them. U.S. says we're not going to get involved. Things start changing, though, on the European front pretty quickly. Let me move my little video of myself. Um, so in Europe, you have two big people taking over power. The first most of you have seen and know is Hitler and Nazi Germany. You also have Mussolini in Italy. Both of them are fascists, which essentially um, means like larger, oops, let me go back, larger, bigger military government, government kind of controls all facets of life, big like capitalist industry, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Hitler gets into power in 1933 um, and very quickly starts making a plan of taking territory in 1936. The first was Austria, Czechoslovakia, and other European countries like Great Britain and France are like, this is scary, but we're gonna wait and see what happens. Um, and they kind of have like a, a line, and that line is Poland. The minute Germany invades Poland, the war starts. Well, you know, Germany does invade Poland in 1939. Actually, Soviet Union let it happen, made some sort of deal with Germany that uh, the Soviet Union won't get involved in the war if you take over Poland. And it's interesting because like Poland is in between the two. So Poland is like, it would be scary if you're in the Soviet Union and Germany is all of a sudden taking a country next to you. But they make some pacts. So the Soviet Union and Stalin just let it happen, let it roll. That being said, the line was drawn for Britain and France. So in 1939, Great Britain and France declare war against Germany. 
Now, this war is pretty intense and pretty insane, which is why you probably see the U.S. get so mobilized and involved quickly, because Germany was such a military powerhouse. They were knocking out people left and right. Uh, so in 1940, Germany invaded and occupied Paris and France. So all of a sudden, France, the French military who was fighting against Germany is now fighting with Germany because they were invaded and taken over. <clears throat> You also have Italy going into North Africa and taking over French territory and English territory. So for a good amount of time, from 1940 to later in 1941, Great Britain is practically alone. Um, and there's this introduction of total war. So what Hitler did, and because planes were able to do this, England is on an island and Europe's over here they would have planes fly over and bomb civilians and bomb cities, right? And so the idea is like, yeah, there might be an ocean separating you, but the minute civilians are being targeted, people start to lose and get weary and not like the war. And that's all until 1941, when Hitler decides to break his pact with the Soviet Union and invade the Soviet Union. You have the Battle of Stalingrad, which is a picture here. Um, so 1941, you have Great Britain and the Soviet Union fighting together against Germany. The other front of this war that's significant for the United States is the Pacific Front, essentially Japan. Um, so starting in the early 1930s, Japan starts expanding and taking over territory, in particular China, Korea, and the Philippines. If any of you guys did the extra credit work, which some of you did, and I wish more of you did. It doesn't matter. The Philippines was technically a U.S. territory, so that was taken over. Um, significant amount of China, the Koreas, and then you have Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. China comes in and takes all of that over. Now, the Pacific Front is not the same as Europe. Uh, European countries were have been there, been empires forever. They were like, okay, we can't let people take over. Nobody cared that much about the Pacific Front. So Japan kind of went off and was like able to do their own thing. And you had countries trying to fight and defend for themselves. They weren't getting much support. That being said, the U.S. sure as heck does care. Because if you look at this, right, you see Hawaii here. Hawaii is not that far from mainland U.S., and you see Alaska up here. So the U.S. is starting to see a little bit more like, OK, this Pacific front is a bit concerning for us. And we want to make sure that we're keeping Japan in check. That being said, they don't do much except for some minimal inter interventions. So here's where we are. Remember, in 1930s, they were neutral. Oh, no. The minute France goes down, the U.S. is like, OK, we need to choose a side and we need to support that side. Maybe we're not going to war yet, but we are supporting that side. And the side that the US chose was Great Britain. Thank the Lord, am I right? Because you never know in this country which side they would go. So the US intervenes by creating and selling weapons. In particular, you see planes here. So the US Army starts manufacturing planes to send over to England. Uh, think about it, Germany's flying planes over and attacking their citizens. Great Britain's having the same idea of flying their planes over and attacking Germany. Um, you also have them creating more guns, more arms, more things, giving it to Great Britain, but also keeping in the U.S. stockpile in case they have to enter the war. Uh, the U.S. is giving quite a bit of money to Great Britain. Wars are very expensive. And when Great Britain was the only one in the war, they're spending all of this money trying to defend uh, these Western ideals of like democracy, liberty, freedom, all that stuff. Um, and the U.S. was like, okay, we got to give them some money. And then in 1940, the U.S. isn't in the war at this time. 1940, they have a draft, which is this up here. There's a peacetime draft. So literally a draft means that you get a, if you get a letter and you're able bodied and uh, able to fight in a war and a man that you have to go, like it is your obligation to go. Drafts don't happen too often. Um, but happened for this time. And it's a pretty big deal because it was considered quote unquote peacetime. But we know like eventually the US is gonna get in the war, right? So they're just kind of amping up for that. And they do get in the war. So December 7th, 1941, I always remember the date because my sister's birthday is December 7th, is Pearl Harbor. 
I think Pearl Harbor is a Netflix movie. Also, it's like a love story, blah, 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 but whatever. Um, but Pearl Harbor um, is an aggression started from Japan. So Japan, you can see some of their planes up here, decide to attack a U.S. naval base, uh, Pearl Harbor, which is housed outside of Hawaii. Uh, and again, remember I said the U.S.'s biggest concern was Japan, because given the layout and geography, Japan could have easily attacked the U.S. mainland, whereas like Europe, all these other countries are getting involved, not as worried about it. Pearl Harbor marks the U.S. entering World War II, declaring war on Japan, and then Germany declaring war on the United States. And so we now have a World War, 1941, where the U.S. is now actively involved in this war. And because the U.S. had the manpower, the economic mobilization, and the money, because they didn't have to spend money on this war for a while to get involved, they really turned the tide of the war and uh, for that reason kind of came out as a superpower, which we'll see. Anywho, at home, uh, the war mobilization, the biggest thing is happening at home, right? We're not in Europe, so we're not, the citizens aren't feeling the effects of being bombed or seeing their towns taken over and knowing what that's like. So the US government had to do a pretty big job of convincing people this effort is worth it. Like we need you to fight, we need you to go to your factories, we need you to work. So you see some pretty intense propaganda. First things first, this is an image here of some army men. You have 50 million men registered to join the military. 50 million, I'm gonna say that again. 50 million men registered to join the military. That's how amped up they were preparing for this war. 10 million of those 50 million actually joined the military and were actively sent out to the war fronts, whether that was in the Pacific fighting against Japan or in Europe fighting against Italy and Germany. You have direct uh, federal government in the economy. So if you look up here, the federal government and if you did my Great Depression assignment, which, you know, I'd say most of you did. Some of you pretended to read it, whatever. Uh, federal government took over factories, took over everything and was like, all right, y'all stop making what you're making. We are making war things. We are making tanks, airplanes, guns, all this stuff. Literally, the government controlled the economy for the war effort, which most economists would argue was necessary, 100 percent necessary. Um, you have this idea of everyone doing their part and promoting patriotism. So this is a good like propaganda thing that you'll see. It's the war effort propaganda, um, but essentially saying like, even if you're not fighting in the war, there's things you need to do. Uh, for example, turn in all your pots and pans so we can melt them down and turn them into bullets. We need you guys to go out and support our men, uh, build things for our men, all that. Which brings me to this, the Rosie the Riveter, which you've seen. It's a great Halloween costume if you're looking for ideas, uh, where women are actually mobilized to work in factories. Think about it. We got 50 million men registered for the military. 10 million of them are going to fight on the active war front. Women cannot be drafted. Um, different discussion about that another day for equality and all that fun stuff, but women can't be drafted. That being said, there's a bunch of propaganda going out supporting this idea of like women's strength and individuality to convince women to go and work in factories. And actually hundreds and thousands of women did like women with their families leaving, going and working in factories every day, being an active part in the war effort. I literally get chills from it and we'll talk about it next time. Um, but, you know, something that's very interesting about this war, uh, but it is divided, is that every American is taking some sort of role for this war, even if they're not fighting in it, even if they're not seeing the effects of the war happening to them and their families. Um, and, it, and it worked. Like, the, this is the best propaganda thing that the U.S. government has ever done. The last thing they did um, is they would pay artists or movie directors to have some propaganda. So like Norman Rockwell, for example, he's like a famous artist. He had a bunch of paintings out where it's like people sitting down for dinner and people Christmas shopping and saying like, our American way of life is being threatened as a way to convince people. You also have, and there's a Netflix documentary, if you're into documentaries, where a bunch of famous film directors were recruited into the military solely for filming the battles. 
And the idea is that they film the battles, the US government shows people what's happening in Europe, shows people what's happening in Japan to sort of promote this like patriotism and propaganda, uh, that this is a very big thing. Um, the Netflix show is called The Five and the Five Came Back. It was really interesting. I didn't even know about this till I started watching this Netflix show recently during this break. And I was fascinated um, that that the U.S. government under FTR, man, they knew they were like, we got to convince all these people to be a part of this war. And they were extremely successful in doing that. All right. Uh, on to the battles which I don't get into that much because it's personally not very interesting to me, but you can look them up if you would like. So the European front, you have um, America and Great Britain and the Soviet Union all trying to gain territory back and go into invading Germany. The biggest battle you've probably heard of is D-Day, which is American and Great Britain troops invading France, trying to take France back. From Germany. And D-Day was successful, but at a heavy, tremendous cost of human life. Um, the Soviet Union's coming from the east, because if you think of Europe, we got like France over here, Soviet Union or Russia over here. Soviet Union's coming in slowly but surely from the east to try to like corner Germany like that. And it works, right? So those three nations, Great Britain, the US, and the Soviet Union, fighting in the European front together, to control and contain Germany, which was no easy feat because they had they were a military powerhouse. On the Pacific side, the US is pretty alone. Yeah, because Great Britain's focused on Europe. Same with the Soviet Union, because both of them are almost invaded. Um, and so what you see are a lot of naval battles and sort of island hopping. The most famous battle is the Midway, the Battle of Midway, where they're fighting for the island of Midway. Um, and so the U.S. Navy is a pretty big deal during this time. And you see like fighting with planes and boats. Can you tell I'm not a military person? Anywho, I think that's pretty interesting because in today's world, the U.S. Navy is very, very well known, the largest Navy in the entire world. And that didn't happen overnight. That was mobilized because of the war against Japan. So you have the war ending in Europe before the war in Japan. And you get into this tricky thing where the U.S. is in Europe, but now the U.S. is in war with Japan. And they're deciding, should we get help from people? Do we just keep going? Blah, blah, blah. Which brings us to the end of the war. Um, we won't do this before the exam because you won't be tested on it. But the end of the war starts the Cold War, which is my favorite thing ever. I love it so much. And so we'll do some stuff with that after. Probably preparing for the ACT because, you know, you got another exam coming up. Um, but here's a couple of little tidbits for the end of the war. So uh, the war ends in Europe. You have your three big winners. This is Winston Churchill from Great Britain. This is President Truman because FDR died during World War II and Truman was his vice president. So President Truman, and then you have Stalin from the Soviet Union. These three players technically win the war in Europe and are deciding what to do with Europe, which starts the Cold War because, and as you see today, the US and the Soviet Union don't trust each other, don't like each other, don't get along. And so even though they work together for this war, deciding what happens with Europe with Germany, with France after the war, becomes a point of contention. So that ends in Europe. They're having some a conference called the Yalta Conference where they're discussing what they're going to do with Germany, all of this stuff. And they come up with like a fairly decent plan. Cool. Then you have the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to end the war in Japan. So remember, the U.S. is alone in Japan for now. And they want to end this war quick as possible. The U.S., other countries were doing this too, but the U.S. has a secret uh, mission to develop the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, where a bunch of physicists and chemists are coming together and testing out the atomic bomb. And it is used for the first time against Japan to get them to surrender. Significant in that it's the only times atomic bombs have ever been used. And a lot of people think the U.S. did it to prevent the Soviet Union from joining in the war front in Japan because then you have less territory to fight over, right? Because the U.S. can say, oh, they won the war against Japan. So war against Japan ends 1945. 
At the end of the war, um, you see a shift from World War I. So instead of this like isolation and we're gonna punish Germany and we're gonna punish Japan, the US, Great Britain and Soviet Union, eh, Soviet Union's kind of mixed on that one, have this thing where it's like, that didn't work. So we need to focus on diplomacy. And diplomacy is more negotiations and strategic talking as opposed to force and war. So Germany is divided up. They build Germany's economy back up. They make Germany a beautiful place, whatever, right? Whereas like Germany today is a strong democracy and one of the strongest European countries. And we are not worried about Germany, right? Because of the US involvement in that. Same with Japan. Um, so building these countries back up slowly but surely making sure they have stable economies making sure they have democratic systems to sort of prevent this aggression that came from germany in the first place you also see this is up here the un the united nations um which still exists today and the united nations is all the nations coming together to solve problems um using diplomacy so right now the united nations well i hope so i don't know i guess well actually probably not actually the u.s probably isn't doing this well, anyway, whatever. The United Nations, in theory, are meeting and talking about coronavirus, right? Because it's affecting the whole world. So we need diplomacy to do that. But with the U.S. not there, I don't know how that would work. Anyway, this is the end of World War II. I hope the notes are okay. I've gotten feedback. I talk too fast, but I'm trying my best. You can slow me down if you need or turn on closed captioning. And just take these notes. You're going to turn them in. I'm gonna grade them, see that you have things. For those of you not doing three questions, you need to do three questions to get the 100%. All right, see you guys later. Well, in theory, I can't pause my video. So you just have to deal with me awkwardly for a minute. Okay, see you later.